So I'd like to just sort of hear from you before you hear from me. Uh, who in here believes that large language models are a paradigm shift and hopes to come away convinced that convinced otherwise? Okay, I'd like to I'd like to hear from all of you after the session. I want to know if I did my job or not. How many people are here because they want an like I I want to they want an I hate notebooks style talk about LLMs? You're not really going to get that either. I'm sorry. Um, it, it, it's it's complicated, right? I started thinking about the ideas in this talk last year as large language models really started to grab the popular imagination, right? And it's easy if you pay attention to technology to sort of get get jaded by people overreacting to cool things. But large language models are a cool thing. But it seemed like everyone was really rushing to find all of these ways in which large language models were supposedly fundamentally different from anything we'd done with computers before, right? And I like new and different things. I like technology. I like being excited about technology. But I think it's more useful to consider what large language models have in common with the systems we've already built, and therefore what we can learn from the past. And I saw a lot of technology and popular press articles using the expression paradigm shift to talk about large language models. And I thought this was a really interesting choice of words because paradigm shift is, you know, it's a marketing cliche for something that's radically awesome and new, but it's also a technical term in philosophy of science that actually means something, right? And so if we look at like, well, what, is a, what does a paradigm shift actually mean? We can look at whether or not large language model systems or the emergence of large language model systems is actually a paradigm shift. Are they a paradigm shift in this technical sense? And I guess I've had the title slide up for long enough that I spoiled the answer to that question, at least as I see it. But the thesis of this talk is that the emergence of large language models does not represent a paradigm shift for computing generally or for most machine learning practitioners in particular. This is actually a really good thing because it means that we can apply lessons that we've learned from systems we've built in the past to large language model systems. And many of the differences that people perceive as fundamental between LLMs and ML systems are not actually differences, but this perception comes from a common place, which may not be what you'd expect. So just a quick disclaimer to start off. Um, I work for NVIDIA. I'm telling you this so you know what my biases might be or, or are, uh, but I'm not here speaking for my employer. These are my own opinions. I'm here speaking as myself. And this talk is not going to be an exhaustive introduction to or explanation of large language models. There are lots of places to get one of those. These days, I'm going to try and keep the talk relatively high level, explaining details only when necessary, and I'll use a lot of analogies to provide context for why some of the things we're talking about are interesting. And if you don't like the analogies, I want to hear about that too, you know, offline after the talk. So. Basic definition, what is a language model? Well, we have something that takes a sequence of tokens, uh, often parts of words, here we're using words, and we produce some conditional probabilities predicting the likelihood of the next token in the sequence. So we have something like this. We have Jack Dawes, love my big is a sequence, and I might have a bunch of possible next tokens with probabilities. Maybe we're saying Jack Dawes, love my big sandwich, the Corvids are always stealing food. You know, big ideas, big sphinx, big cheese, big data. You know, it could be any one of these. Any one of these things or probably a lot of others. But in practice, most people don't see these probabilities because most people interact with large language models, in particular through APIs or services that do all of this stuff underneath the hood. They take a bunch of, you know, natural language text, convert it to tokens under the hood, and we'll finish the, finish the prompt for you. And in this case, they'll maybe finish it with my big sphinx of quartz, right? Now, that was sort of a basic completion. If we look at a fully fledged application like ChatGPT, we see a more interesting interaction of a tuned language model in an application context. So if I say Jack does love my, which is not a very useful thing to say to a human, right? But ChatGPT will complete this for me and say, Jack does love my big sphinx of quartz, and it will also tell me why I'm thinking about what Jack does love in the first place, which is that it's a pangram in, in English. Um, so I'm often going to be simplifying the presentation in this talk and thinking about higher level things, like the things you'd get from an LLM API or an LLM service, rather than the things you'd get from interacting with a raw model that you'd have to build yourself if you were building such a service. But just for those of you who haven't thought about what the tokenization process looks like or think about what these models are actually operating on, here is how we would split up that 
a way to split up that sentence into tokens so that you see we have parts of words that are, that are sort of common across our entire corpus that the model was trained on. These get assigned integer values and then we can use them in the model. Now, when we describe large language models as just conditional probability calculators on sequences, it might be hard to see what the fuss is about. Um, we've had generative models in the past that can do this, right? Think of a Markov chain, right? Who here has built or used a Markov chain before? All right, good number of people. So basically we're saying if we have a fixed length sequence of tokens, what are the probabilities of something happening next? And those are not the same as large language models and we have sort of an example that I think does a good job of showing why. Here I've trained a fourth order Markov chain on the complete works of Jane Austen. This means that the likelihood of any given next word will be based on the preceding four words, and we're going to try and get it to produce the opening line of Austen's Pride and Prejudice, which is one of the most famous, quoted, parodied, cliched, <laughs> at this point, sentences in English literature. Does anyone know what that is? Anyone willing to admit that they know what it is? Um, okay, so the, we'll, we'll see it in a second, but we'll see what the Markov chain does first. So it is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of something to talk of again to Mrs. Allen or anybody else. It's not great, right? Um, we start off, we've, we've clearly memorized enough Austin to almost make it through that opening line, but then we go off the rails and no one is gonna worry about Markov chains replacing human authors or claiming that their paradigm shifts. Uh, by contrast, if we look at ChatGPT4, we not only successfully complete that famous quotation, but we're able to elaborate when asked, right? Explaining the context, plot, and themes of the novel. So large language models are clearly strictly more powerful than the probability calculators we've had for natural language in the past, right? They're, they're more powerful than basic word to vec style embedding models. They're more powerful than a lot of things. It's obvious that they're new and different but I think it's important to be precise even when we're excited about technology. And I think it's instructive to consider whether or not large language models are a paradigm shift and what that would mean. So I wanna look at some paradigm shifts from the natural sciences and see if we see an analogy here. So the term paradigm shift comes from philosopher of science, Thomas Kuhn, who had a book called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And we'll, we'll talk about this with a couple of examples. So let's say you're interested in the problem of infectious disease before the mid 19th century. You probably subscribe to a family of theories that blamed factors like fog or night air, foul odors, or even the morning breeze carrying the noxious breath of swamp creatures to your city. This general family of theories called miasma blamed this bad air or foul water containing decomposing organic matter for infectious disease and just about anything else that could go wrong with you and proposed a variety of mechanisms for how this invisible matter actually acted to cause disease. As a result, many early public health efforts focused on eliminating the sources of bad odors and ensuring access to clean water by removing waste from cities, improving sewer systems, and so on. After many years of increasing evidence that microscopic organisms rather than noxious particles from decaying matter were responsible for infectious disease, the scientific consensus moved on from the miasma theory in favor of the germ theory of disease. So there are a couple things that are interesting here, right? One is that the concrete steps society had taken to address disease under that miasma theory actually worked <laughs> because they addressed things that were correlated with the microorganisms that cause disease, right? You might decide not to eat a slice of moldy bread because it smells bad, but it's the mold and not the smell that is what's gonna make you sick. But the paradigm shift to the germ theory meant that we had better and different causal explanations for infectious disease and that any work that anyone had done on the theoretical explanations for miasma were no longer relevant or useful. We had to sort of throw these out. So things we knew are no longer useful and that paradigm is specific to scientists working in a given area. I think the second one is important because today if you take some takeaway out of your fridge and it smells bad, you're not gonna get out a microscope to decide not to eat it, right? Another familiar example of a paradigm shift is how we explain the movements of things we see in the sky. For centuries, the prevailing theory was that the Earth was the center of the universe. Heavenly bodies had circular orbits around the Earth. This didn't actually explain what we saw in the sky, 
So scientists like Hipparchus and Ptolemy introduced the concept of epicycles, orbits around orbits, which could be composed upon each other indefinitely to explain almost any observable motion. This is what it looks like just for Mercury, and then we can see what it looks like for everything all at once. So the interesting thing about this epicycle approach is that you can actually get it to do a pretty good job of <laughs> predicting where things are in the sky. Uh, it's, it's almost like you can reasonably approximate arbitrary functions by adding circles of varying size and, and phase together. Um, Copernicus had a sort of simultaneously conservative and revolutionary approach to this. He moved the sun to the center of the universe and suggested that the Earth moved around the sun as well as rotating about an axis that had its own seasonal tilt, um, which captures some of what we see in things appearing to move in the sky. But he didn't propose the first heliocentric system, and he retained some of these things that are wrong about the Ptolemaic paradigm, like circular orbits and epicycles. But these observations eventually took hold in the century after his life and made, became the dominant paradigm, which made it possible for astronomers like Kepler to propose a system that had the advantages of the Copernican system, but was simpler and still more elegant. And I think it's interesting because Copernicus was correct about a lot of things, but the things he was correct about were his differences with the preceding paradigm. The things he was wrong about were the things he retained, right? And again, any work that previous astronomers had done calibrating epicycles was done under a shared understanding of what this was actually explaining, which became useless once we decided that that wasn't an adequate explanation anymore. So to get even a little more philosophical for a second, do we experience paradigm shifts in computing at all? Is computer science, what kind of discipline is computer science? What kind of discipline is computing? Is it just engineering? Is it just math? Is it a natural science that just doesn't look like other natural sciences? Hmm? Is, is it a UI? Ah, yeah, so that's a paradigm shift in human-computer interaction. Yeah, so I think this is a really good point, right? Like, I think that, um, I think there are some fundamental things about computer science, algorithms, complexity, programming language theory, um, that are not gonna change, right? If they're, if they're gonna change, that is gonna be a paradigm shift. I think there are a lot of other things where engineering trade-offs change because of the places where we're building systems. And this means that something that didn't make sense 20 years ago might make sense again today. But we're not throwing away the stuff we did 20 years ago, we just maybe aren't using it for all of the same problems. I think the interesting point though about like going from a text UI to a graphical UI is that I think there are limited cases where you do see paradigm shifts, local paradigm shifts, maybe not global ones, right? Uh, the way we solve this problem is no longer relevant. And I think a good example that's relevant to the subject of this talk is how we do language processing, right? Like if you think about grammar-based um, sort of symbolic NLP, you know, from the 50s through the 80s, it's basically no longer the way people do things. People do statistical NLP, even though these approaches are complementary. It seems like, and I mean, I'm not an NLP expert, it seems like these approaches are sort of, um, have sort of taken over, right? So I, I think you can also say, I think you could probably argue that building applications in the cloud, I've actually argued here in, in this complex of buildings that building applications in the cloud could actually be a paradigm shift for how we build certain kinds of applications. But I think these are local and not global. So if large language models don't represent a paradigm shift, then the things that people are saying are radically different, fundamentally different, are probably not actually fundamentally different. Um, so let's look at a few things that I've had a lot of people tell me are radically different about LLMs. First, I guess I should ask, since people are being really good about answering questions when I ask, what's different about LLMs? Yes? It changes the way that I interact with the information on my computer. So it, yeah, it's a fundamentally different way to interact with the computer, information on the computer, good. It's, so I have an interesting result, we should talk about that offline. But yeah, it's, it's, it's maybe even more of a black box than, than a lot of conventional classical ML models. Good, yeah. Unsupervised training or self-supervised self training, yeah. Good. yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, it, better results, right? Yes. Unstructured data, yeah, that's that's a, that's another good a good difference from classical ML. I mean, certainly we've had other approaches pre like you know with computer vision that, that work really well with unstructured data or, or speech to text or that kind of thing. Yeah. So I yes. Reportedly emerging abilities. Yeah. So if you have a model for like what's probable of happening and how things relate to each other in an arbitrary string of natural language text, maybe you can actually start to reason the way humans reason. I don't know if I believe that, but I think, I think you see some examples that suggest that it's possible in limited cases. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna talk about the ones that people have told me before today, now, and uh, the first one we'll look at is that large language models by themselves are not suitable for use in your application because they're gonna do all kinds of bad things if you don't, if you don't keep them under control. Right, your large language model might become unexpectedly hostile. It might produce dangerous information or incorrect information. It might cause you reputational damage if you know this information was allowed to get out of there. So you need to have something to protect the rest of your system from the outputs of your model. Right, a guardrail of some kind. This is, I mean, people have heard that this is different about LLMs. All right, a second thing is this idea that you can't provide a useful answer to a query in every case without having additional context, right? We, we're we're going to have a lot of talks this uh, week about retrieval augmented generation, uh, but the idea that the model doesn't have an answer for your question, you have to augment the, the model's knowledge with some external knowledge that's relevant, and this is different about LLMs. And then the third difference is that if you're building a traditional machine learning model, you need to do all of this feature engineering. The performance of your system is gonna depend on how well you do at feature engineering. And with LLMs, you just send it some text and it sends you back some text, right? You don't have to do that anymore. All right, so let's look at these in turn and see whether or not they apply to ML systems as well as LLM systems or not. So the raw output of LLMs may be unsuitable for a given application, this makes LLMs different. But if we consider other machine learning applications, guardrails are actually ubiquitous. So consider recommender engines, uh, say in a retail application. You don't wanna waste a customer's attention recommending something that you can't sell them. So you shouldn't recommend something that you can't legally ship to a customer's address or that you don't have in stock. You also don't wanna recommend them something that's already in their cart or something that they bought from you yesterday. So you'll take the output of your retrieval model and filter it using rules or another model. You wanna identify the items that will be most interesting to the user, so you'll score those filtered recommendations with another model. And then finally, you probably have some other criteria to ultimately rank your recommendations based on, on business criteria, right? If it's a retail operation, this might be something like proximity to a fulfillment center, uh, margin, likelihood of return, things that basically make you wanna recommend one thing over another, all else being equal. So we actually need some pretty sophisticated guardrails around a recommender system to do useful work with it. Now you might say, well, recommenders, that, that's, a, that's a deep, deep topic, you know, that people, people become experts in that. Um, what about a much simpler machine learning model? Well, let's say we have a bunch of points that we've sampled from some space, it doesn't matter what they are, right? And we've fed a line to these points, right? And we wanna make a prediction for something that's outside of this range that we trained on. Well, as long as the thing we're modeling the response has to be positive, but the thing we're querying on might be less than what we trained on, we could get in trouble with this model, right? Because this line is eventually gonna get down to zero and then even go below zero. So if we were talking about, say, real estate prices per area, right, we might get to a point where a storage locker would be free. Right, if we were pricing it with this model. Now you might say, well, don't use linear regression for something that can't be zero. Um, but this is just, I mean, there are lots of examples of very simple models where we actually need guardrails if we're gonna put them in production. Anything you're automating, really, you need some kind of sanity check on, right? Okay, so a second thing is this idea of extra context, uh, like we'd see in our T-Roll augmented generation. And 
this seems like it's kind of a unique pattern. A lot of people are talking about it. A lot of people are excited about it. But this is a pattern that we also see in other applications. If we have, for example, a payments fraud detection system, that's going to deal with not just the point information about you know where what you know where was I, how much did I spend, what currency was it in, uh, you know, how how did the transaction proceed. It, it'll also have information about what I've done recently, what customers like me have done recently, about what that merchant has done recently. And that information is all going to get funneled in, you know, within the 100 milliseconds or so that the payments processor is going to decide whether or not the transaction is legitimate and assembled into, assembled into a feature vector dynamically. If we're thinking about like a if we're thinking about like a search application or a media recommendations, there's often a lot of additional features beyond the query, beyond the user, sort of context, context about artists, context about what other people have done. That gets added in sort of implicitly as well. So these are all cases where machine learning systems benefit from context beyond just the information in that point query in the same way that language models do. And if you're doing this with machine learning, you're using a feature store. If you're doing this with LLMs, you're using a vector database. But I think it's sort of fundamentally the same kind of thing, right? You need some way to efficiently assemble a query that has more information than the actual query does. OK, third, third potential difference, feature engineering. You're not just going to pass raw data to your classical ML model the way you'd pass raw text to an LLM, right? You're going to transform it. You're going to scale it. You're going to encode it. You're going to apply a kernel. You're going to do something to better expose the structure of the data so that you can get better results out of that model training algorithm and then ultimately out of that model in production. And the details you're going to use, are, the details of the technique you're going to use are going to depend on the model. So if you have a one-hot encoding of a categorical for a really simple example um, and you're going to consume it by a linear model, you'll use n minus 1 bits to encode n possible values, because we don't want to introduce bias by having a 1 in any position of, of all of these vectors. If, on the other hand, we're using a tree ensemble, in that case, we'll use n bits, because the tree ensemble training needs to be able to distinguish between classes with one comparison to work as efficiently as possible. So this is a super simple example of two really basic models where you have to do something different to get the best results in feature engineering. Now, does this apply in LLMs? Well, if we're getting plain text input from an application, defining the behavior of our model based on a behavior in plain text, we don't have to do many of the exact same things we'd have to do in a feature engineering pipeline in um, classical ML, but we have to do something that looks a lot like feature engineering and is also model specific. So how many people regularly interact with large language model services? About half. So how many times have you done something like this? We're adding information to the prompt saying, please help me, don't make my puppy sad. Um, you know, let's let's use a let's use a chain of thought so that your answers are more probable than the thing you just made up. Um, you know, we're we're doing all of these things, and these sort of tricks, these sort of tricks accumulate, right? These tricks accumulate in the same way that extraneous features accumulate in machine learning systems. But this prompt engineering, or this sort of how do you prepare your data? to get the best results from a model is still something you have to worry about. It's still model specific, and you still need a way to track it with experiments. So I think this is not really a difference from classical ML systems either, if we, if we sort of zoom out enough to sort of see the similarities here. So where are these, wh where is the real difference, or what, what does Will think the real difference is here between classical ML systems and large language model systems? Well, I think it, if we think about the systems themselves and how we build them, what does it look like? Well, if we're, if we're thinking about classical ML, we have this sort of multi-phase software lifecycle for building these systems. Uh, we start off sort of thinking abstractly about what we're trying to solve. 
um, gathering the right data. We have this thing that a lot of people focus on, which is sort of the, the experimental data science where we're really working on feature extraction and engineering techniques and, and model training. And then on the right hand side, we have to put this into production which involves doing things to make it resilient to all the things that we're going to run into in the real world <laughs> that we're not going to run into in the lab, right? And having to worry about those things makes up for a lot of the challenges with machine learning and production. And this also applies to LLMs. So the interesting distinction is that with LLM systems, though, people aren't usually training their own models from scratch, right? Meta spent tens of thousands of compute hours training Llama 3, very few organizations are going to say, hey, this seems like a good idea to try this quarter. Um, but what a lot of organizations are going to do is they're going to start with one of those models. They're going to see how best to prompt it. They're going to see what kind of context they can provide to get better results. They're going to tune it. They're going to adapt it. And they're going to experiment to get better results for their own applications. And they're going to have to figure out what success means for that application. And in a lot of cases, business metrics are going to be easier than model metrics because, again, these, these are not necessarily interpretable. But I think this is where the perceived differences come from. People who aren't yet using machine learning extensively in production are always focused on the left-hand side of this picture because they're thinking, what can I solve with machine learning? How can I do it? How will I train a model to do these things? But with LLMs, you already have something that's sort of competent in an interesting way at solving problems that are interesting to you. And it's not hard to immediately think, hey, I can, I can see where this would be useful, right? So I think this is why people tend to claim that these production concerns are what's different about LLM systems, because they can think about how they would put LLM systems into production, and they haven't yet thought about how they would put ML systems into production. Now, as you know, though, having that model answer the question and bring you onto the right side of the picture is not the whole picture. The picture is super complicated. Features like guard railing, context lookup, efficient feature vector assembly, it's just sort of scratching the surface of the potential production ML challenges. And that's where I think the rest of this talk comes in, because the fact that we've dealt with these challenges in the past as, as an industry, as a community, means that we have a map, sort of some guidelines for how to deal with these with this different but not fundamentally different environment of LLMs. So I want to talk briefly about a few different ways in which we can learn from history in thinking about LLM systems. The first one is to think about some of the ways in which LLM systems are a special case of search and recommendation systems. Um, since I'm here at Buzzwords. I, you know, there are a lot of people who are really good at search and recommender systems. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that one, but I do want to sort of give you some space to think about that. The second one is to think about what lessons we can learn from LLM systems as ML systems. And then the third one, which we're going to spend sort of a little bit of extended time on, is thinking about the computers that our LLM systems run on and how thinking about LLM systems as computer systems can actually improve the performance of these systems in surprising ways by taking ideas more or less directly from systems research. So I think it's useful to think about LLMs as search or recommender systems for both philosophical and practical reasons. Uh, both are sort of intended to surface relevant information. Both are complex systems. Both require careful attention to and definition of pipelines and metrics. Uh, I think search is especially interesting because search underlies so many context-dependent applications of LLMs explicitly. There's a common sentiment that you see that RAG is sort of low-hanging fruit for LLM systems, right? Like, I'll just be able to ask questions of all the files on my hard drive or all the files on my intranet. Um, and there is some really great RAG tooling out there. I think people have done really impressive work with RAG. But I think the interesting thing about calling it low-hanging fruit is that we really haven't solved search yet, right? I don't, I don't think I know anyone who really loves any general purpose search system at sub web scale, right? Whether we're talking about finding messages on a chat service, finding emails or documents on your own computer, finding something on a corporate intranet. I, I mean, I think thinking about these and then thinking that, thinking that RAG is low hanging fruit is actually kind of terrifying, right? Um, we can't solve the challenges of search just by putting machine learning on top of it, right? So we, 
that's something I think we need to consider, and I think that's something that this community is well equipped to consider. I think we also need to consider user experience, though, because using search effectively is a learned skill. People have skills that they've learned from doing keyword searches. I mean, if you're, if you're my age for, for most of your life, right? Uh, and the kinds, of, the kinds of searches that you do for embedding search, vector search, are not gonna be, not gonna be the same. Right? I mean, how frustrating is it to do like an e-commerce search and get semantic results when you're trying to search for keywords? Has anyone had this experience? Like you, want, you want a particular grocery item and like, well, here are some things that have some angular similarity to it. Um, I don't like it. So, so that's, I think, the important thing from the search perspective. Um, we've already talked about this similarity with recommender systems. But I think it's worth thinking about post-processing more generally as an opportunity to impose constraints. Right? I think there's sort of a tension between people in the community who say, well, you should really tune your model to impose any constraints you want on your output versus people who say, hey, you should post-process or you know, you do rejection sampling or something. And I think that thinking about how people build recommenders, which are systems where you have a lot of constraints and a lot of goals and a lot of metrics to optimize for at once, um, is probably a good way to think about how to do LLM systems as well. And I think it's also interesting more directly because transformer models actually have a lot of traction in the recommender systems world. So the next thing I want to talk about is how LLM systems are like classical ML systems. And I think one way in which there's a lot of similarity is think about all the things that can go wrong. And I'll just list a few of the things that can go wrong, right? Data drift, right? The real world has impolitely diverged from my training environment. Um, accidental feature dependencies. You have two features that are correlated. You train on the wrong one. It gets dropped you know, from the pipeline by someone else who's producing the data. Um, and then you're stuck. Code dependencies rotting. You can't pip install the package that you installed two weeks ago because it conflicts with something that you can only install today. Uh, general bugs in the pipeline that go undetected because they're not exercised. I mean, this is a software engineering challenge. It's a distributed systems challenge. So all of these same things can go wrong with LLM systems, but we're not just tracking features going bad over time. We also need to be tracking prompts going bad over time, right? Do we still need all of the clauses in this prompt? Um, our models may be running in a separate data center from the rest of our application. Distributed applications are increasingly the norm. They're hard when they're geographically distributed, especially when you don't control one part of them. That's also hard, right? And we may need to specify that we want a particular version of the model, which is something you can do with a lot of providers, but not a lot of people do necessarily to insulate us from potential upstream challenges. There are also analogous priorities in ML and LLMs. And I think if you've done a lot of classical ML, you've, you've probably heard or advised people that, you know, think about your data quality first, think about your feature engineering second, think about the fanciest model you can train as sort of a distant third, right? Put in, put in the effort, you know, up front, and then make life easier for the model. The representation of what you're giving to the model matters. Make it, make it easy for the model to learn the objectives you want it to learn. And I think we have really analog analogies with the sort of emerging wisdom about how to do LLMs well. Prompting techniques are first, right? Try different prompts first. Try a prompt with explicit examples of what you want first. Try a prompt with additional external context. If you can't get that to work, maybe try a prompt optimization framework or a prompting framework more generally. If you can't get that to work, try tuning. Don't bother pre-training, right? I mean, it's, it's sort of a similar, a similar hierarchy of needs, right? Of focusing on the inputs to the model, making sure that you are making it as easy as possible for the model to do its job. I think also one thing that I've done in preparing this talk is revisited a lot of classic you know, machine learning systems advice. And it's really interesting how much these um, kinds of things from you know a decade ago really hold up in the context of LLM systems. Um, these are some rules from uh, Martin Zinkovich's Rules for Machine Learning Best Practices for ML Engineering. There are about 40 rules. 
Um, some of them are more or less relevant than others, but this is sort of interesting experience uh, from you know, building a bunch of ML systems, mostly recommend recommendation and search related at Google. And I think, I think these all hold up, right? Start simple. Make sure you have a way to know what's going wrong with your system before you put a model in the middle of it. Um, it's tempting to build pipelines with a bunch of different models in them, but that makes your system much harder to understand, especially if you are delegating things that you don't know how to do explicitly to another LLM, like tell me if this is a good response to my other question, right? Um, clean up features you aren't using. Well, how many people who've built a prompt have just seen it sort of gradually get longer and longer and longer, you know, until you, until you realize that it may not be serving its purpose anymore? And then keep track of where things are actually going wrong, I think is another, another useful sort of guideline. So a lot of good advice in this, in this article, but I think a lot of good advice about ML systems is also good advice about LLM systems if you zoom out and think about how it could apply. Okay, the last thing I wanna talk about is how LLM systems are actually general computer systems. We can use LLMs more efficiently and discover better systems for serving them by thinking about the computers that LLM systems run on and keeping some fundamental principles in mind. The first principle I want to talk about is the memory hierarchy. You have a very small amount of very fast memory, and then you have several layers of dramatically larger but dramatically slower memory. So if we go from CPU registers and caches to main memory to disk, the difference in size and latency between these is truly staggering. Reading 64 bits from a CPU register can happen within a single cycle, you know, a billionth of a second but reading 64 bits from a spinning disk might take four million cycles. So if you have to read everything from a spinning disk before you operate on it, you're looking at getting one four millionth of your ideal performance. Right? Not, not, a, not a good starting point, right? Computer systems mitigate these latencies by exploiting the principle of locality, meaning that if you access something now, you're likely to access things nearby it soon. So it's possible to cache nearby values at higher levels of the memory hierarchy to improve performance. The final principle is parallelism. Can we run independent tasks at the same time, whether within or across processors? And I think essentially every improvement in computer system performance in the last 60 years has hinged on improving parallelism, hiding latency, or both. So with that in mind, let's look at how thinking about systems can make LLMs better. Remember that when we're doing language model inference, we're taking a sequence of tokens and predicting the next one. So we're doing this repeatedly. If this looks quadratic to you, it's because it is, right? We're, we're having to do essentially on the order of n things, n times to get a result that is n tokens long. A fundamental difference between transformer-based LLMs and earlier language models is the extent to which our representations of tokens are dependent on context. In that Markov chain example at the beginning, we were just dependent on our immediate context, that four tokens leading up to a token defined a probability distribution. In word to vec techniques, we'd learn a representation of a token that was similar to any token that could appear in certain contexts. And so we might learn similar representations for pronouns and articles. By contrast, in the LLM, each token in the context window has its own representation. So we don't need to learn a single representation for it, for example, for an entire document, but we could learn separate representations corresponding to the reference of each distinct it. And we can do this because the representation of each token takes into account arbitrary context information based on a learned relationship of what other tokens are relevant to a given token. The representation for a token can represent, depend on the representation of any token we've already seen, but not any token we haven't seen yet, which makes sense if you think about the ways people use language responsibly. At a high level, you can think of this as sort of summing up a bunch of, sort of getting a weighted average of the representations of all the things that a token's value depends on. But at a low level, this is several large and relatively expensive matrix and vector operations. That probability distribution of the next token we generate is gonna depend on this representation, but we need to be able to refer to it in the future because the representation of any future token might depend on the representation of this one. 
we don't want to recalculate these things, so we're going to cache them. Now, if we store this cache in a way that's convenient for an inference framework to use as a contiguous vector of numbers, we're going to run into all kinds of problems because eventually we're going to get holes in this cache. We're going to have to reserve some spaces so that it can grow. And we're generally not going to have desirable performance. And that space is going to be wasted if we don't use it. If instead we treat it like a cache in an operating system, we get much better results. And that's what this paper is proposing. This is uh, treating this cache of context information that we need to use over and over again for these inference requests like, like an operating system cache. All right. Just have a couple more things quickly here. An interesting thing about this paper is it was published at an operating systems conference and not a machine learning venue, too. So if we look at autoregressive inference from another angle and consider this problem of quadratically calculating only one token at a time, um, we'd like to be able to exploit more parallelism. There's a lot of parallelism within each step, but we can't do multiple steps in parallel because we can't see the future. And if we could see the future, we'd already have the string we were trying to generate. So if we were to have the whole output already and pass that in as a prompt, then we're essentially pre-filling our context cache and identifying in advance what tokens are relevant to each. So instead of doing this once for each, once for the first, second, and third, and so on, we want to do it all at once. How do we get the output without computing it? We might be able to take an imperfect prediction of the future from a smaller, faster model, and this will allow us to provide our larger model with a long stream of tokens to validate. We can process this stream, check it, because validating is fast and can happen in parallel, and then accept the longest prefix of tokens that are consistent. So people who've discussed this approach called speculative decoding have alluded to its connection to speculative execution and microprocessors. The idea is that your processor can do a lot of things in parallel, but only if it has a large enough window of instructions to execute. If we think of this factorial function, we might look at these instructions at a time, and when we get to the bottom of the loop, we might want to be fetching instructions at the bottom of the window and executing the ones at the top. But we can't fetch this instruction at the bottom of that rightmost window because we don't know if we're going to take the loop or not. The way that we solve this problem in hardware is we do something called branch prediction, where we guess whether or not we're going to take a branch, and then the rest of the processor doesn't have to stall. This is a good metaphor for speculative decoding, but there's actually a better metaphor for speculative decoding, which is a paper called slipstream processors. And the idea is that when people started having chip multiprocessors, they were wondering what to do with them, because all their software was serial. And so what are you going to do with that extra core in your laptop? You know, you're not going to start writing parallel software, are you? Right? Instead, you could take a simpler version of the program that you wanted to run and run it in parallel. You wouldn't actually commit the results of this program, but it would run ahead, because it was doing less work, than the program you actually wanted to run. And it would pre-fill caches. It would prime branch predictors and so on so that you could get better results. I think this is a great analogy for speculative decoding. And I think it's interesting that, as far as I can tell, no one is talking about it. Right? This suggests that there are both general and specific metaphors that we can take from systems work to improve our LLM systems. So we've talked about paradigm shifts, whether or not large language models are a paradigm shift. We talked about what might be different about LLM systems and seen how some of these things that might be different actually aren't. We've looked at how we can think about the challenges of ML systems and use these to make better LLM systems. And we've looked at some techniques inspired by computer systems to make more efficient LLM systems. It's been great spending this time with you. Thanks for staying a few minutes long. I'm happy to take questions offline.